Hello everyone, welcome to Talks of Google. I'm Kevin Valk, and today we have the creative team behind the documentary Bat Kid Begins. <laughs> and so we'd like to welcome Mike Jutan, uh, who played the penguin in the film, Patricia Wilson, CEO of the Greater Bay Area Make-A-Wish, and Dana Nachman, who uh, directed the documentary film. So thank you guys so much for being Thanks here. Thanks for having us. Thank so you. Patricia, we'll start with you. Just can you tell us how you turned San Francisco into Gotham for Miles? No. Okay. Well, <laughs> this is going to be a Interviews long... over. <laughs> Talk's over. Great. Mike. <laughs> it's like so... See what I had to deal with? <laughs> <laughs> so um, initially when I began The Wish, um, uh, if you haven't seen the documentary, you'll, you'll discover in the film his wish was to be the real Batman. And he was five at the time and battling leukemia. So game on, right? What does that mean to be the real Batman? And so when we have a wish type that's creative, you get... Um, yourself creatively in the eyes of the child and try to find out who is Batman to him. What's that look like? And we did a series of interviews with his volunteer wish granters and his parents. And we, I offered, I like to offer choices because then I know if I offer this and that, that maybe they can get, you know, and I offered to, you know, maybe we could do a caper to school and we could kidnap his principal or, you know, or maybe he's the bad guy, you know, depending on how he feels about the principal. Or, you know, I offered we could do something at Six Flags and rescue someone on a roller coaster. Or I offered, you know, I was driving home one night. Um, I live and work in the city, and the fog was rolling in, and I thought, you know, it's pretty cool. This could be Gotham City. It's kind of more Gotham than New York in many ways. And so I offered a very bold statement. I could turn San Francisco into Gotham City, and that was the <laughs> one that resonated. And I began doing it on a five-year-old scale, thinking, you know, well, I can, you know, a cable car, it'll be a little corner. But it just got bigger and bigger based on the number of people who wanted to be involved, and it ended up being on a scale for grown-ups. And uh, he was oblivious to that, so it's one of my favorite things, is that he still got his five-year-old version that we were very protective of him. Um, but beyond that, um, there were a whole lot of people, 25,000, over 25,000 showed up personally and over 2 billion impressions worldwide. Right, and so what do you think attributed to that? Because that, it was just, it was such a huge global event. I know, Mike, it kind of started with your tweet that went out that was just like, hey, here's what's going on, and all of a sudden it just exploded, so. Yeah, I knew spending this much time on the internet would finally pay off. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little plug for you guys. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, it, you know, it, it just was, I do some volunteer things, and, and Make-A-Wish was something that I'd chosen to do this year, and um, EJ, the guy who played Batman, had, had pulled me uh, into this magic, and it was very small at the time, but it was starting to get bigger and bigger, and I thought, oh, this is great, you know, I write a blog, and I, I, you know, I'm on Facebook and Twitter and everything too much, and Google Plus, sorry. Um, <laughs> and yeah, all the things. And, uh, and I thought, well, I'll post some photos of just what's happening, and um, people that are interested will get to see it, and, and maybe that will help inspire other folks to do some more volunteering, because, you know, I'm taking the day off work and running around the ballpark. Um, dressed up as a bad guy, it's pretty fun. And that was like one of the rehearsals, and from there, that's where um, apparently, so says the um, research, I guess, on this, that from that post, it started to then just snowball like crazy, and people really liked the idea of it and, and just were kind of racing to be involved themselves. And you know, it, it was interesting. There was a, um, a, a psychologist from Philadelphia who, whom Dana interviewed who flew out to, to study why so many people were drawn like a magnet to this event. And I, it, it, she and I have spoken since a, a couple of times, and I do think that right now in this digital age, I think there's a level of fatigue. Um, people are tired of the sensational and bad news and, and feeling a little overwhelmed, and it was right after the sequester, it was right after. So I think, I think you know, they're, they're tired of covering people who are famous for being famous. and and. Um, so I think it was ripe for a good story, and it was exciting to think that social media became social good. Um, so that part is really interesting too. That people who spoke—I mean, the, the, a couple of the under the two most important themes that happened um, in the tweets that were measured. First of all, I had a 97% positive rate in tweets, which is un unheard of. Right? It, it, it's never happened before. Um, and of that, some of that was sparring with the penguin because the penguin had a handle. So. <laughs> Oh, yeah. yeah. And my tweets were evil, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the, like, the two messages were you, right. um, it renewed people's faith in humankind. And the other message was that people felt it was the best thing that ever happened to San Francisco. And that can make me cry to this day because if you had told me that I'd be involved in a project that could reach that magnitude, I would have never believed you. 
Um, but it was that kind of day. It's the kind of day um, I saw a news report, someone reviewed um, the documentary and said, you know, it was the kind of news event that people remember where they were that day. And they'll tell me, oh, I was in LA following the story. I remember, and that's yeah. just insane Nuts. to think that we were part of something that made people so happy. So it's delightful. Yeah, it's one of the only, one of the very few documentaries that I could actually name that is actually a positive message. <laughs> because usually they're just so depressing and so <laughs> bad. You know, like it's just, it's, this is just a really, really feel good. So Dana, I kind of want to get into that where it's just, you know, wah, where wah, were you? Wah, 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 wah. <laughs> but, no, but like where, but it was great because it was definitely a breath of fresh air. But so what, so what brought you to the project? Because you came in after the day, but did you know what was going on during the day and what was... That's always my most embarrassing question. <laughs> I missed the entire thing. Like, I feel like I was not one of the two billion people who followed it. It's just so embarrassing. I, th I think I was editing that day, another project, and I was really immersed in that. And Soundproof room. Yeah, and I was, um, I guess, just kind of zoned in that day. But um, I had done three very, very harsh, downtrodden, <laughs> um, difficult, but important documentaries before this, and I was finishing up one. Um, on toxic chemicals in all of our products and and the lack of regulation. Question way I watched more awkward now. <laughs> <laughs> no, and it's true, yeah, and that's yeah, yeah. A, but it's why I wanted to. I was looking for something more positive. Oh, you watched it? I watched it. Oh, good girl. Um, <laughs> and so well, I. She was, doesn't shampoo her hair anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so I was looking for something lighter. Um, I was looking for something more childlike. I have three little kids. I was looking for something that I could engage with them on. Um, so I was looking for something just right when this happened. And so I learned about it the day after. Um, um, when a, a bunch of people I was on a conference call with were talking about it, and they were all men, and they were all kind of in their 40s-ish, and they were all talking to this little boy in this cape and running around San Francisco, and I, I Googled it, and I was like, oh my gosh, what an amazing thing. This is perfect. Too bad I missed it. The lucky person who's doing that documentary, um, you know, God bless them. And, and then um, we, my producer Lisa and I got a call with Make-A-Wish, um, and they are like, oh yeah, come in tomorrow morning. And it turned out people had, had reached out to them, but they were so inundated with this thing blowing up and going viral that they couldn't deal with the documentary team at the time. But we had the good fortune of finding out we were going to do it regardless of what it took, whether we had to crowdsource all the video or whatever we had to do. But at the end of this two and a half hour meeting where we first met and became great friends and launched this project, I said, you didn't happen to shoot it, did you? She's like, oh yeah, we wanted to have a fundraising video for our gala, so we shot it with five cameras. And so that really made it a heck of a lot easier for my editor, for, for all of us. And then we kind of filled in the blanks with, um, with the interviews and finding all the different people, like the woman, Susan, from Philadelphia and others who had flown in for this and just a myriad of other people who made it happen. Wow. So was that, was that a difficult process, though, of taking all, getting all that footage and trying to make a cohesive story out of it? No, it was such a funny thing. I mean, maybe Kurt, my awesome friend and editor and co-writer, would disagree. But I, I mean, we had the, the layout for the movie right away. I mean, I applied for a grant very early on, and the nuts and bolts of the film stayed the same from the beginning. So there, I think this was easier in a way because the story was so laid out. I mean, it was a chronology. I mean, we knew we wanted to have his backstory in animation, so it was less sad, more kid-like, get it over with, the sad part in the first 10 minutes of the movie. And then from there, have the rest of the first act meeting all the people, um, and then and um, the beginning of the second act would be when, when Mike's um, blog went viral. So that kind of launches the whole viral nature of the whole thing. And they're kind of like now, oh, no, this is we thought it was one thing. Now it's another thing. That was the second act. And then the third act was the day of. And so that kind of came to me very quickly in the structure of it. So really, it was just filling in all the pieces. And um, all the cameras that day really followed. So we knew the capers. You know, We had all the capers laid out. And so it was actually pretty seamless. I mean, the hardest thing about it was that I promised Patricia we would have a cut on the one-year anniversary of it. And I had never made a film um, in less than three to four years, and so this is going to be about <laughs> 10 months. Ten so I months. Like, oh, sure. I, well, I didn't know how long it took to make yeah. a film. Yeah. Like, what, what, you know, I mean, when anybody... should you, by the way? <laughs> right. When well, anybody applies for a job, they say, uh, yeah, of course you, oh, you yeah. know what the person wants, and they say, oh, she wants it in nine months? Yeah, I, I can do that. No tell worries. Them, tell them how many hours was it that Kurt wanted to watch all the footage? Before? Oh, yeah. He, that was the one thing. So, Kurt, I had two editors fall through, yeah. um, and that was a source of a lot of stress for me, just because I had it all written um, and got it in the place that I could give it to an editor, and I didn't have an editor. And so then a really talented friend of mine who's a director in his own right, he, I didn't know he would take on um, somebody else's project, and he needed work at the very moment that I needed an editor. So he took it on, and I had it laid out, and so I was like hoping that he would just start editing right away. And he's like, no, 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 I have to watch every frame of it. And I was like, 
every frame of it. I mean, it was something like. Do you know how long Mike talked? Four terabytes. I mean, Mike is just. A, he was goes like on and on and on. Hours. Was, <laughs> I was like, I was watching that. I was like, why won't I stop talking? <laughs> Jeez. I can't stop. No, and so um, so he insisted on watching every moment of it, but it was such a, the right move because he he found things that I didn't have time yet to even find, which were little nuggets between Miles and EJ, um, the Bat Kid and the Batman, and it was really the right move. But he, I mean, I think he spent a month. It was about I think at that point about three terabytes worth of footage, um, and it wasn't 4K. Wow. <laughs> so it was it was um, a lot of footage. That's crazy. So and so Patricia, so from the initial time when the wish came in from you know, November 15th, it was. And so yep. when, um, like, how long was that between when the initial wish came in? So I got the wish uh, end of January, early February, and uh, my program director walked in, and we'd worked together many years, and she said, I have your Christmas present. <laughs> <laughs> I have a superhero wish. And I'd always wanted, thought it would be fun, and I thought it would be the, our, our network um, that, of volunteers and fun and wild and crazy people would really get behind it, and we could do a really cool... Um, creative wish like that. So that was always, I'd see other chapters do it and think, oh man, San Francisco, would, and we love costumes, right? Mm -hmm. So <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> well, I think we could we could do a good job. So I had um, the benefit of time to plan it. Um, partly the family didn't want to do um, it any sooner than November because he had his surgery to have his port removed, which is how he got his chemotherapy. So they wanted it to be after his chemotherapy so he'd have energy uh, right. to be a superhero. And it was after farming season. Um, his dad's a farmer and um, also a volunteer fireman, and mom's a nurse, and so they're just kind of this quintessential live on a farm, adorable, tiny little Tule Lake. Oh, beautiful, like, and so it's just, so awesome. they, oh, that's an, and, and the film, it's just, it's, it's gorgeous, yeah. Yep, yep, and so um, I began, you know, in initially doing the work to understand the creativity part and who Batman was, um, and then early on, because they, he was so shy, we weren't sure how that was gonna work, I, I suggested to the family that he be a mini-me, and I have a full-size Batman, and EJ was my first choice um, because I'd worked with him 10 years prior on a project um, in which he created a video game that fights cancer cells. Ben's game, yeah. Um, yeah, Ben's game. Uh, and so I knew he'd be amazing, partly because he's a former stunt double and he's uh, an acrobat, and I needed, they said, you know, they were more interested in gadgets, not the villains, so we didn't want really scary villains. Um, so we began putting it all together around that. And the first thing that came to mind was a cable car rescue on Knob Hill, like why not, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then the rest kind of fell into place because Miles was a huge Giants fan, so we wanted to involve something with a ballpark. And um, it's still kind of crazy to think. You know, we, you and I've talked a fair amount since then, and we both had true confessions. Wine might have been involved, I don't know, but... <laughs> it uh, <was>. but <laughs> True confession, <laughs> it was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and Scott. But yeah. Um, that both Scott. of us literally Googled post-traumatic stress disorder. Yeah, yeah. Because of this experience. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and it's so pleasant, it's yeah. wonderful, but it's also really scary. Yeah. To be at the center of a story that was one of the biggest news stories of the year, and I'll tell you... You're just desperate to do a good job. A very personal story. So I was online dating during that time. <laughs> yeah. And I, I didn't think to take my profile down. Hmm. Uh, and so mm, when I logged on, wow. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh, and then it was delete, 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 block, block. And then it was You're funny. Like, I'm busy till November 15th. <laughs> 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 well, it, was, it wasn't until like January. I logged back on and there were, I want to be your superhero. And oh. going, oh, wow. Uh, right? I had two marriage. I got a utility belt lovely. for you. <laughs> <laughs> what does that oh, even my mean? God. <laughs> and so it was block, delete. And, you know, and people could take my image and put it in Google Images and figure out who I was, oh, right? No. So I began, you know, immediately saying yeah, I was Google Images. I'm a, oh, oh, uh, <laughs> a children's oh, uh, charity executive. Yeah. I sort of not, and it was like I was in the witness protection program. When I sit next to someone on a plane now, I won't tell them who I am. <laughs> like I do something. <laughs> I work at the children's stuff. charity. <laughs> yeah, yeah, involved with charity. So and like, so you got brought in by EJ. So can you talk yeah. about just she mentioned, you know, with not creating these scary characters. So your Penguin was a very iconic one from like the '60s yeah. series. Can you talk sure. about that kind of development and, sure. and working with Miles or EJ? to kind of make sure that it wasn't scary and sure sure yeah so not being an actor at all like I'm a software engineer like everybody else here <laughs> everybody um, <laughs> to some extent anyway I'm sure um, so you know this is by far not what I do for a living um, I'm obviously one of the like I'm sure Google has the exact percentages but I'm one of the say 4% extroverted computer scientists in the world um, so we're a rare breed, but still, nonetheless, not an actor by any means. And so 
I, I just really wanted to make sure that I did a good job. And, um, you know, my girlfriend really, oh, now fiance. No. I can oh, say, oh, my hey. fiance. <laughs> um, she's going to love that part. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, my fiance, so my girlfriend at the time, uh, she said, you know, she really kept me grounded with the whole thing and said, you know, this isn't like, as it started getting bigger and bigger and bigger, I was like, oh my God, like all these people are coming. They have all these expectations. They want to have fun. They want to see this like fun, silly caper thing. And, you know, how am I going to make sure that they enjoy themselves? How am I going to make sure that I, as a first time volunteer for Make-A-Wish, <laughs> it's a hell of a one to start with. Um, uh, how am I going to make sure that I represent Make-A-Wish in the best way that I can, in the way that they want me to represent them, to this glo now global audience, unexpectedly global audience? So, you know, I and everybody else involved in the project also were very concerned about doing that and doing the best possible job we could. So I kind of reverted back to my sort of engineering, my sort of, you might say meticulous, I guess obsessive engineering <laughs> background and just kind of researching as much as I could. I was like, okay, so I watched all the old Batmans when I was a kid, so I'll rewatch them. I was like, oh, thank God, it's on Netflix. <laughs> so it was maybe two weeks out and I started having a panic attack that, <laughs> that I, you know, I didn't know the character and I wasn't gonna do a good job. And I don't even know what his walk is like. And so I watched um, as many as I could find quickly and uh, the 1967 movie, I believe it is, 68. Um, I watched that like five times, just over and over, and I'd rewind just the penguin parts and be like, okay, so it's wah, wah, wah. You kind of, he's got this sort of like, kind of leans into it, and he's squinting his eye all the time. And he kind of, there's like a few like really silly kind of things like, uh, you know, like puns that he'd throw in there, and it was all hilarious and ridiculous. Um, and of course, we decided to base it off the old characters because that's what Miles liked, and also, um, as much as I love the Danny DeVito penguin, um, yeah, that's not going to work uh, for a five-year-old. Um, it's you know, it still gives me nightmares. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, so I just I just watched a lot of it, a lot, a lot, and practiced the walk. And um, once we got the costumes from the, that was like a week out. We got the costumes, so I hadn't even seen what it was going to look like yet. You know, I tried that on. I, I wore the monocle all the weekend before. I just kind of wore it the whole time. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, the penguin is doing the sneer because you have to to keep the monocle in. It's like part of the costume. I, I had no idea. Um, so, yeah, I practiced a lot with the monocle. <laughs> I was doing this for a while. It was kind of hard to keep those things in. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was great. So just kind of a lot of just sort of effort and energy into trying to understand what I was doing and see examples of very excellent people, Burgess Meredith in this case, mm -hmm. doing that thing in the past um, and sort of getting my own twist a little but, but really kind of researching uh, the best way. And then ultimately remembering what my girlfriend said was remember, and EJ said this, Patricia, everybody was on the same page, this is all for miles. In the end, 30,000 people are going to come and watch this. Every news agency in the world is going to be there, like burning through photos. Google Zeitgeist is going to put you in the video. Thanks for that. That was awesome. Um, but ultimately, this is about Miles achieving his wish. And those other 30,000 people might be disappointed, and that wasn't our job. Yeah. The job is to make sure Miles has a great time, and that's all that counts. So that kind of takes the pressure off the fact that BBC's like, so what do you think? Yeah. They're like, oh, God. Remember when we yeah. were rehearsing? Yeah. And you and, and EJ were in the ballpark, right? So we're doing rehearsal, and it was Mike's first time that he's hearing the whole run, run through. So we're sitting there giving like, a run through, what? going, okay, so the fireboats are gonna be over here. And he's like, fireboats? There's fireboats? And I said, yeah, and, and I know that That's they're trying fireboat. to get clearance to, to have a plane pull with a hashtag. He's like, there's gonna plane? <laughs> no, actually, there's three. And, and so because all and this so is where the helicopters are coming in. I was like, what <laughs> is going on? And, and it was th that day, and we were, doing being goofy and I thought wouldn't it be cool if I was able to figure out to do a handle for Penguin and have mm -hmm. Penguin tweeting that day and had the idea and then quickly managed to say this that's insane Patricia that'll never happen but then literally the next day Twitter called me and said do you want help and I said oh hell yes uh, yeah. <laughs> yep. yes and I have this crazy idea and I've always wanted to tweet a wish in real time and this was a public wish so it was okay and they said, we're on board. And initially they had 
four people at the end of the day, they had 12 people managing our Twitter feed. Yeah, it was crazy. It, well, how you show it in the film, just the build up to it. So, you know, you have 10 months to plan, or, you know, 11 months to plan this thing, and then all of a sudden, the final month, this explodes. So, can you talk about that time of it exploding in that? <laughs> so like, how did you manage it? My heart to, is beating faster. To, I know, where you can feel the tension <laughs> building. So, thanks to his uh, Facebook post, he literally cut and paste. Um, the schedule for the day. Like, this looks great. Which we do to our volunteers all the time. He goes, this is the coolest wish ever. And then a blogger <laughs> picked it up. Out. So SFist, February, or, or November 8th or 9th, I forget which day now, um, posted it. And we saw it, and everybody, you know, and I had people tagging me on Facebook and private messaging me and going, did you, did you know about this? Like, yes, I do. <laughs> working on it since January. <laughs> <laughs> and, and mind you, we're doing 380 wishes this year. So we're working on lots of wishes, yeah. right? Um, and so that kind of happens, and the weekend comes and goes, and I see it mentioned a few times. And then on Monday, it gets another blogger, and then by Wednesday, the traditional press started coming, which is, I find interesting that traditional press covers whatever happens in social media. <laughs> um, so we decide what's going to be news, and then they cover it. And so then it was kind of like, and you know, so first it was local news, and then we started getting national news, and then we got international news, and then we got Al Jazeera and the Goodyear Blimp called, and I, I think. The joke internally, I mean, we were la I was like, who else is going to call? I said, what are we going to have next? The president? And then he did. Sure enough. <laughs> and we did. <laughs> and he tweeted out a, a beautiful message. He did. Yeah, yeah. Miles, you know, that's, it, it was incre incredible. So can you guys talk about just that when handling that sort of big just event and Dana just kind of your, you know, just handling of the movie with the family and Miles, because I'm, I'm guessing like once it blows up, it was like, oh, this isn't what we wanted. This exactly. Was what we well, for. and you can't control that, right? So it wasn't, um, I gave the family, again, choices. And I said, look, um, this thing has blown up. We've never had this happen before. My instincts are, I think it'll be good, but it may not be what Miles wants. So we can change the date and I can go private and do something completely different. We can keep the date just change the locations, or we can stay steady in the course. And they talked about it, and they chose to steady the course because they had so many family who were coming in, and they would scheduled this for so long, and they said, we think it'll be good, and they weren't really big. You know, the beauty was, he's not on Twitter. He's five, so none of it was spoiled for him. But, um, you know, I, I got... So I think the first opportunity to see the chief of police after that was a, a couple weeks later. And both of us were confessing to each other the concerns we had. I mean, him for public safety and, and me too, to go, would this make Make-A-Wish look bad? Will it make San Francisco look bad? You know, what could go wrong? Um, I do, I really, really regret though that I didn't have Miles really rob a bank because I think we would have gotten away with it <laughs> and I'd never need to fundraise for Make-A-Wish again. <laughs> Banks could have been competing, no, rob me. Um, but uh, it, was, it was intense that day, but it was, when the day unfolded, it was that beautiful. I mean, the chief sir talks about um, how people would be asked, like the little guy's getting scared, people were getting too close to the car and it was spooking him out. So we told the police that, and they asked people, you know, folks, can you help us out here? And they were like, oh, sure, no problem, I'll step back. And he said, yeah, we'll take that any other day of the week. <laughs> well, that was the incredible thing, that the whole city just kind of came together and we're just like, oh, we get it. Like, there was no violence, there was no fights, there was no, like, it didn't see, I don't think there were any arrests either, you know? Nope. It was just, everyone was just and like, we're cool. And they didn't need to clean you know? up. I mean, the, yeah. so the folks who normally clean up after the Super Bowl parade or wherever and said, we've never had people pick up their stuff, he goes, it, it, was, it was pretty, it was, it was yeah. like something that really, really think was not possible right. happened that day. Right. Yeah. And so, Dana, when you're kind of handling the film and working, did you work with the family at all? Because you had to, because you had to shoot a lot of footage of like the backstory and stuff. So how is that handling with them? And Yeah, so at first we um, treaded really lightly. Um, it's funny to think about now, because I consider them really good friends now. And, and Miles is very good friends with my son, who's eight years old, just <laughs> a year older than Miles. And they're really close. They try to figure out how to video message each other and stuff and yeah. they talk on the phone and so now I consider them friends but back when we first started um, Patricia reached out to them first and said you know we're interested in doing this documentary um, and really I think a lot like the day we didn't you know we our plan was to get the movie to make the movie but we were so rushed in making it I wasn't really thinking that much about what would happen after you know we would go to a film festival hope to sell it um, but we were so busy making the movie we didn't think a lot about that and then Warner Brothers decided to buy it. Um, and so it just like the day of, it really blew up more than we thought it would and go theatrical. So I think when we first started talking to... Yeah, I thought it was going to be in the conference room and I was going to be showing it to my volunteers. <laughs> yeah. Wow. 
fun. Yeah, I mean, I was hoping it would be a b- bit more than that. <laughs> than that. <laughs> but, um, but I, you know, in my wildest dreams, I didn't think that um, what would happen, ha- you know, happen. Um, and so it was amazing. So we, we um, first reached, I met them at the um, opening day um, ceremony, or the, uh, Miles threw out the first pitch um, for the Giants. And so we met them that day and we just kind of got them used to us. And, um, and then a couple months later, we went to their farm and we just really hit it off at their farm. Um, my son came with us and, um, and so he played with Miles the whole weekend and we shot them playing. And, and they're just a lovely, lovely family. Um, and you know, by knowing them, I understood that their intention for this, um, to the contrary, they didn't want to become famous. I mean, they were, they're, they're just pretty cash people. And so the fact that this happened, they couldn't have been a better family for this to happen to, to have a, have their wish go viral because they're very, they're pretty chill. Um, but, but also we had to realize that they, they, we weren't going to have them do press for the documentary. We weren't going to have them do anything because they're not celebrities. He's not a child actor. I remember early on, somebody said, uh, we want to profile Miles as a child actor. I'm like, he's not a child actor. He's a amazing cancer survivor who had this amazing day that he doesn't even know what Twitter was or anything else, and he doesn't know what it became. And we want to kind of keep it that way. And so when the film was, gonna, was done, um, I actually talked to his mom, Natalie. I said, do you want him to see it? Because it really shows what the day was. And, sh- and I, you know, I was kind of conflicted about that because I wanted him to just think it happened. Yeah. Um, but she said, you know, no, she wanted him to see it. And then he wanted to see it the next day and the next day and the next day. And so <laughs> even though, you know, because kids are great like that, they can suspend disbelief as much as they want. And so even though they know exactly how it happened, he knows, um, he still loves it and still believes that he is Bat Kid and that EJ is Batman and it's still very present in his in his life. And he he beat some bad guys in Patricia's city. Yeah, he calls it my city. Patricia he, City. He, we um, call it that too. <laughs> on, you owned on, it. And he's I mean he thinks that, that EJ is the real Batman. I mean he'll say, oh he like EJ is the real Batman. On Sunday after his wish, the Chronicle reprinted that cover, you know, Bat Kid Save City. It was awesome. on the front page of the Sunday awesome. paper. And he was walking downtown and saw it in one of the newsstands and saw it you know, Mom, I'm available to save more lives today if they need me. <laughs> I mean, in his mind, he... I mean, and that's a beautiful segue into kind of EJ, because it's one of the most, just, it gives me goosebumps, and it just sucked me right in the gut. One of the most beautiful moments in the movie that I thought was um, when you guys did, when EJ set up the whole acrobat thing, the whole training thing, and this kind of like, almost kind of like muscle memory for the for Miles when it was like, hey, I'm gonna take, because EJ, we could describe EJ, I mean, he is a software engineer, a uh, game developer, and an acrobat, and he, so you, sh- the showcase is all in the film. He is Bruce incredible. Wayne. He is like, Bruce Wayne. <laughs> he is literally Bruce Wayne. And it's so. Oh, cooler. Yeah, only cool. He's like the most intimidating guy if he wasn't so darn nice. Like, <laughs> yeah. you just, you know, you're so scared of him, and then you talk to him, and he's like, oh, he's nice. You're like, he's this just, is what every human yeah. should he's aspire just to. He's genius. That's all. Yeah. He's great. Well, and, <laughs> but it was so genius that what he did was, and what you guys did was, you put Miles through this superhero training, and everyone got involved in this superhero gym of, uh, with EJ and doing everything. So everything that was done for the day was also done the night before. So Miles like, oh I get oh I did this. I get I can do that. I can do this flip. I can do this crawl over. But the the part that got me was the acrobat handshake. And so it's yeah, he goes, this. Yeah. This and he did that. And then the next day when he went to the hotel, you know, he's kind of scared by Batman, by EJ, but then he does yeah, that. Like, and it's just like, like his like, eyes are yeah. like, I'm in. Like I got like, this. Like I know, know I know this guy. And he's like yeah. you know, and that footage is pretty amazing because I did not allow any cameras when he first met Batman because I thought if he spooked, wish is over. We're going right. to do whatever Miles wanted. And everybody was mad at me. And I said, no, no cameras. This is not. And they said, well, this is. We weren't filming a documentary. Right. And I right? <laughs> it's like, yeah. never I said, thought no, this was going to happen. I'm doing a so. wish, and you're yep. not going to mic him. And that's mm-hmm. how it is. So it, that just kind of put some people were pretty miffed at me. But the Wish family taped it themselves Damn. on their iPhone or they, or they had they, a uh, video a camera? Yeah, yeah, somebody on sure. the way out of town said they had never had a video camera their whole life and somebody gave it to them as a present the night before. And um, <laughs> yeah. I know, and so when and so they shot, I mean, I agree with you. I think the Circus Center video the night before was some of the best, it's the best scene in the film. It's my I think. favorite part of the um, And something yeah. nobody ever saw because the family was the only ones who had the had the video, and um, when they the circus center supposedly shot a little of it there, but they lost the footage, and so the only footage that remained was what the parents had wow. shot, and they did such a heck of a job on it too. Like usually when you get home video from people, and it's not the best, but they did the whole scene is from their footage, and there's some really great shots um, from the day of that that um, Nick Miles' dad also shot, and and they did an amazing 
an amazing job. We got very lucky. It, I mean, it, it, uh, the Circuit Center was scary because we got a call from them and some of the press had, were starting to follow the family. And, and you know, that's something I didn't even think about. Like when the Hyatt wanted to put the Batman, project the Batman logo on their building, I thought that would be cool. But that told everyone where they were staying. And then yeah. they had to have more security. I mean, I never in my wildest dreams thought we have to now protect this family because now they're becoming celebrities. And pe then the press was just, some of them, just plain vultures. They, I mean, they had to find this family. And they were all trying to get some sort of exclusive and they wanted the wanted to see your costume the night before they're trying to and it's like yeah. it's in my apartment well i pace back and forth <laughs> trying not to you know pass out and for charity <laughs> it's just you know something you've never experienced i mean to have a news crew in our lobby saying they don't want to leave until you go down there going uh, well, this just never happened so yeah. we, we were ill-equipped to know how to handle um, and obviously a really small team. We only have 27 staff and 550 volunteers. And so it's, a, you know, it was just our little group. And so fortunately, a lot of people came forward and started volunteering. And I would said, yes, <laughs> yeah. we need your help. Whatever you can do. And so can we talk a little bit about just EJ, just his, uh, like, because you brought him in, obviously, because you'd known him since he worked with Make-A-Wish a while ago. Yep. And so just his development of it and bringing you in and yep. just kind of, the whole we had a series of um, conferences um, where we were planning the wish and saying, what about this? What about that? Or sometimes I would see the costume is a piece that we all worked on together and was problematic for us. Um, and, you know, and I knew that that was the most important thing to Miles. So there was a lot of pressure going, oh, man, if he gets his costume and cries when he sees it because he was so excited about the new costume. So it was just a collaborative, um, amazing process. And that I have to say, um, my, my, the only gift I have is selecting the right people because EJ, I mean, these folks are brilliant and they're fun and collaborative and they're way more creative. And so they took it to a level, you know, so all that rehearsal and the dynamics and specifics are, were the volunteer team that were on the wish. Wow. And so how do you know EJ? Uh, so we worked together for a long time at, um, at Lucasfilm at, at uh, Industrial Ed Magic in, in San Francisco. And so he was at LucasArts for a very, very long time about 19 years or something, um, and then transitioned to ILM for a few years. Now, now, um, uh, now he runs his own software company. Uh, but uh, yeah, so we worked together for quite a long time, and I always just thought, man, that guy is interesting. He was like the most interesting person I ever. He really is, you know, the, that um, that uh, the bearded guy, the the Dos Equis guy, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> most interesting <laughs> man true. in the world. And you know, and his wife, like, who is the damsel in distress, right, which so is almost as funny the, that she's a damsel, yeah. right? Because she, we just call her the damsel because she's never in distress. She's <laughs> like the most successful, amazing woman of all time. They are a, they it's are a dynamic like, duo as a couple. Yeah. Before. So uh, yeah, they're just amazing people, and um, uh, you know, I, I just kind of admired EJ's skill at work. He's so good at the work he does. He like writes, you know, machine code and stuff just because he wants to optimize things as fast as possible. Who does that? <laughs> it's like, I'm going to write it in Python because <laughs> like, that's not impossible. Um, <laughs> he can do whatever. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so he's, you know, he's just a very, very interesting guy. But one of the things I really liked about him um, at work was he, like some of my other closest friends, are not just a software engineer or just an accountant or just a lawyer, whatever it might be. They have this kind of crazy life outside of work where they do all these unusual things like, you know, like flying trapeze in EJ's case. Um, or, well, EJ does like 50 yeah. odd things. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I have friends who do this really, really interesting volunteer thing or like flying to Africa once a year and, and uh, doing this kind of like amazing like uh, local volunteer work that's really needed there. And it's just, you sort of collect this group of friends where they're doing much more than just their job and their, their life, their everyday life, because that's stressful enough, as we all know. Um, so I think that really sort of grabbed me about EJ. He was, he was a, just such an interesting sort of global citizen as well as being just a great person as well um, and a good colleague. So, um, so I love that. And then they, so I, they came over to a barbecue at my place, just having this kind of random summer barbecue. And, um, and uh, on the way there, I guess they were in the midst of trying to figure out who the villains should be. And, uh, and it was Sue's idea. Sue said, Mike should do it. Mike should be, Mike should be the pain. I'm not sure if I was the Riddler first. And then I had, I definitely wasn't the Joker, too scary. But yeah. they're, they're, they were like, Mike should be one of the bad guys. And uh, so they, he, they pitched that to me on the day of, what are you doing November 15th? Just say yes. 
And so I like, didn't even have my phone. I'm looking through my Google Calendar. My Google Calendar. Oh. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, a little plug there for you guys. Um, so I'm looking through my Google Calendar. And, uh, <laughs> And, uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm like, uh, well, it doesn't look like I have anything on, sure. <laughs> um, I didn't know what I was agreeing to. And, of course, neither, neither did he. You know, at that point, it was <laughs> 50 to 200 people in a climbing gym or something. Right. And, boy, were we surprised. <laughs> 25, 30,000 people and 2 yeah. billion worldwide, you know. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. And what I loved about it, too, he brought in his, all this technology. He brought in that his uh, he invented gauntlet, that. he invented that, which was insane. An arm which, projector, yeah. An arm projector, which if you guys haven't seen the film or wasn't, uh, didn't see it, it's basically this arm projector where he was capturing or shooting off uh, video messages and everything that came through was on that. So um, and in the film, there's kind of this funny thing how it's like, oh, there were some technical <laughs> difficulties and like s some funny stuff like that. But that was such a great added touch to the entire just film to have that in there. I mean, who, who has yeah. that? Who invents that stuff? Actually, remember yeah. your yeah, first yeah. film festival and you said, tell him about sitting next to Kurt and the audience reaction to the film? Oh, when they were laughing? So when we first showed the film, you know, it's so scary to first show a film because you've seen it while you're editing constantly and you don't know, are people going to like it? Is it going to work for an audience? And we were sitting showing it and people are just cackling laughing and I turned to Kurt, my editor, and I was like, I didn't know we made a comedy, you know? And so, yeah. so that was really great. But I think one of the, just to get back to EJ for a second, I think one of my favorite parts of the movie is, um, and the day is when EJ was making this projector and he, you know, he could have done anything. He could have had it on an iPhone, which was the original idea. Um, but he's like, oh, then I'll be an adult with an iPhone. Um, if I project it, then I'm Batman. And so, so this was the, what his goal was to do. And a couple nights before he was pulling all nighters making it work and he broke it and he thought and this is like I think to me what the epitome of the movie is and, and what of the event was is that you know he said okay well Miles will never know that we were gonna do this cool thing we'll just do it on the iPad and it'll be fine and he said but my whole life I will have known I could have made it even that much better and to me that just gives me chills that, that's like my favorite moment in the whole movie because I think all of these people the movie isn't really about a sick kid who triumphed and had a cool wish um, it has that in it but I think the movie is about when these people like EJ, like these guys, come together to make this amazing thing happen just for one person. And I think that's so, it's just not something we see very often. And I think that's why it touched a nerve with people, even though until the movie, people didn't know really the behind the scenes, but they knew it was special because something that big doesn't ha just happen. And so I think that you know, even though that moment was only for Miles, um, which was the whole point of the day and nobody really knew about it, I think people sensed that amazingness. Um, and so I, I mean, that to me is what, the, what EJ's about, what Mike and Patricia are about, and everybody who made it happen. Yeah, just amazing. Um, and we'll take some audience questions if anyone has questions. Oh, sorry. Uh, I, I missed the beginning, so I might have missed this, but were there any issues getting the rights for the characters and using them? With the How about Warner. those giants? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, no. I, I wasn't so, involved in their issues. No, but. so the beauty um, of it was is that when it did get big, I began to worry about that too. Um, fortunately, I had a couple of things on my side. Um, a search that helped me understand that I could name him Bat Kid, which was not trademarked. <laughs> um, so I thought we were avoiding um, the Batman issues. But then, um, as it turned out, Warner Brothers and every actor who played Batman tweeted, and then Warner Brothers ended up buying the film, and they loved it so much. So my efforts to be worried about it <laughs> we're, we're ill-fitted, I guess. <laughs> and for me, because I knew that Warner Brothers really didn't buy documentaries, it was, just wasn't even on my radar, I just really followed the letter of the law in terms of um, we just documented what was there that day. If we were making a graphic, it wouldn't, it, we made sure that it didn't have the um, Batman wings and we would make it our own. And so we went to great lengths to do that. Um, but then in the end, you know, maybe it wouldn't have mattered because Warner Brothers bought it. But still, it was the safer way to go. We didn't use music that we didn't license. You know, the, when we did the, the Batman logo, it, 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 it was tweaked enough. And so in our animations and our graphics, we made sure that it was different. I remember the day we were sitting in an, one of our follow-up meetings, and I said, yeah, you know, Hans Zimmer composed music for Batman. She's like, what? <laughs> Do you have his contact info? I think so. 
So um, yeah, and so he made. We were shooting with him, which was I love amazing. That part of the movie. Yeah, yeah. it's a great he's part. He's so cool. He's so he was so <laughs> yeah. gracious. You know, all his yeah. people were like, he only has 20 minutes, and he was with us for like he's two hours. Like, he was wow. so nice. <laughs> and he um, so he did uh, a lot of movies, but he did the Dark Knight trilogy um, composing. And he uh, he was playing for us uh, what he played for Miles. He made a, a song for Miles, um, which was similar to the to the Dark Knight theme. And so I said at the end of that, you know, do you think we're gonna have trouble getting that the rights for that? He's like, oh, you very well might. Here, let me just make something else for you. And he just composed a song right there on the fly. <laughs> <laughs> like, all right, of course, you I just did else. that. Like it was actually one of the, like when you geek out when you're Crazy. a filmmaker, a documentary filmmaker, that like was one of my top three of geeking out moments. Yeah. Wow. And so and so one of the questions we got um, from one of our uh, viewers was. Um, so what exactly, after this whole thing, what did this do for just Make-A-Wish in general? So um, we have the Bat Kid bump. So our referrals from the number of children um, who uh, uh, request a wish and who qualify for a wish went up 46%. Wow. Um, donations went up 25%. Yeah, yeah. Is, I my work cut out for me. <laughs> yeah. um, but we're, so far, so good keeping up. Um, there haven't been any other requests. A lot of people ask. I mean, so there's a couple of things I'll, I'll share that could be questions that come up. Everybody asks how Miles is, and Miles is great, and Miles is in remission, mm -hmm. and he really thinks he saved San Francisco that day, and he'll, he's going to second grade, and he lost his first tooth last year, and he still loves baseball, and, and he's just back on the farm, and I love that, right? That, that he thinks fondly of the wish he had the day he saved San Francisco. It's like a so true cool. Hollywood ending, right? Yeah. Yes. Happily <laughs> ever after, it's just like, that's tied up beautifully. And it it's, it's not it's unsimilar amazing. to all the rest of us. While Dana was working on this project, we all went back to our lives. We had more wishes to do, and um, so the, the impact certainly has created awareness, um, and a lot more people. Um, I think what happened, we had a wish about two months after Bat Kid, and it was with the San Jose Sharks, and we had a child who wanted to be a shark for the day. The fo footage is on YouTube. I encourage you to see it. Um, and. It, they just nailed it in a way. I mean, again, it wasn't me doing it. All I did was make the connection, and they thought, well, what if we... So they, before they even got to that game, they told everybody who was coming to the game that we have a special... We're, you know, we're facilitating, we have a VIP, and is having his wish. And then at the arena, they told it was the first time in the Sharks' history that they allowed anyone other than one of the players to, sh to um, skate through the Sharks' mouth. Wow. And he signed a one-day contract, and then the child lost it in front of, you know, and everyone in the arena fulfilled that wish that night. And the people who normally wait outside for the players to get their autograph waited out for our child, wish <laughs> child, Sam Tagason. And there were so many people that requested to buy his jersey. The Sharks now sell it in the store and donate the proceeds to make a wish. So uh -huh. some of those things, we've had a few things that go viral. That had over 2 million hits in a week, um, and people just became, you know, engrossed in that, and it's beautiful and sweet, and we've had a number since then. Um, so I think that creativity piece will, will continue, and I think the engagement piece, and, and we're challenged to try to figure out how to use that. So how do I engage people in a way that's meaningful to a wish, that is good for the wish, um, and then doesn't create a, a disaster for us to try to manage, but that, that there are more people who want to do good, and it's nice to be able to be a matchmaker and make those two things happen. Yeah, and can you, and can you, we'll go, kind of go down the line, but just what was your favorite moment from the day? And I guess, Dana, for you, what was your favorite moment just in creating the film and finding that voice? We'll start with you. Yeah. Start, start with me, okay, okay. All right, ooh, favorite part of the day. Ooh, that's always a tough one, because there's so many. There's, I said, my answer to that once, which is a terrible answer, <laughs> was when EJ finally tackles me at the end of the ballpark and my portion was done and I didn't screw it up. Because <laughs> I was like, I never wiped so much sweat off my forehead in my life. But um, <laughs> that's a terrible answer though, so let me make up a new one now that I've said that to the entire universe. Um, <laughs> it wouldn't be the first time, I guess, right? Um, <laughs> you know, I think for me it was, I actually really was very excited at the amount of people that were there. Um, that is, of course, in opposition to the goals, not just the original, but the ultimate goals of the event were just uh, Miles's enjoyment. But to me, it became something bigger and bigger and bigger. And, uh, and it became such an interesting opportunity to sort of, um, for San Francisco really, to kind of plant this flag in the ground and be like, this is what's possible. 
because it was insane. None of us expected this. And, you know, I'm sure some people wouldn't have gotten involved if they expected it to be this crazy. And uh, certainly not us. We would have done it in any case. Um, but, you know, I think it became such a big thing. And to me, that meant it was going to be very visible. And I thought that just the sheer size of it would encourage people the world around to do similar kind of things. Um, that was important to me sort of in a, in a kind of the world changingness of this event, um, that it could carry it forwards um, in a way. Um, Chris, uh, Chris Taylor, a great uh, friend from uh, Mashable, he um, posted one of the first articles uh, to go viral about the event. Um, and he's featured in the movie as well, and he's really, really great. But about a week after the movie, he said, uh, oh, sorry, a movie, a week after, <laughs> a week after the day, um, he posted something on Mashable that said, Bat Kid, day, Bat Kid was beautiful, let's keep it going. And so that was a very interesting kind of call to action, uh, I thought, and to me was one of the larger goals of being involved. I, I think a week or so after that, I kind of compiled my crazy, like, stress-addled brain into a big, long blog post, which became my longest ever read, or my, my most ever read uh, mm -hmm. post on my, on my, um, on my blog spot account, <laughs> my blogger account. Thank you, Google. Um, no, seriously, like it's like <laughs> it's like my entire life. Um, so you know, it became like the most visible thing I've ever posted, and so that was another way of I think playing it, sort of paying it forwards and taking the day that happened magically and kind of turning it into a message. And and that's another reason why I sort of jumped into. Uh, when I heard about the movie happening, I was so excited about it, and um, Dana was so passionate, came with the exact same spirit that we had of giving and of just really being really keen to get the get the message right and um, to do the best possible job we could um, with such an important idea. And so, so I think, anyway, long story short, um, I think actually the visibility turned out to be very, very important, I think, and has led to this documentary and has led to then Warner Brothers buying it. It's crazy. Um, lots of people seeing it. And, and people, the real practical realities of people emailing me and saying, <laughs> really loved the movie, decided to do volunteering in um, my own state, my own country. I had a friend from Germany say, I couldn't believe you did that thing. That was crazy. It looks like so much fun. I've been meaning to volunteer for a long time. I never did it. And I signed up last week after seeing the movie. It's like, um, yes. <laughs> like, that's the goal. That's the goal. Yeah. yeah. So for me, um, a few, but I think that the day of, um, it was time, we had a bus that followed the, the, um, the two Lamborghinis. And um, that was for the Wish family and a, a few folks embedded for the Twitter account. and. And all the Wish family, and, and so there were a few moments when the bus, you know, we'd cheer, and then there would be a hush of silence where we were all so moved. And you know, the first time that morning happened when we took our website down um, a, a few minutes after the Wish started, and I thought, am I supposed to be excited we took the website down? <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's a good thing. Wow. And then um, when the president uh, tweeted, and then the White House and First Lady, and um, there were moments where it was a cheering, but then you realized you started to l use the magnitude. And in fact, on the bus, I started, you know, Jimmy Kimmel or something, I don't know, we started getting offers already. And I, I began thinking about that, going, <laughs> this isn't, you know, when is this over? <laughs> yeah. And, um, but the moment, the most poignant moment was after the last caper, it was at the ballpark, and seeing Miles so happy, and he ran the bases, and it was like, yes. He was Batman for the day. We did that. And everybody else happy. And San Francisco amazing. And so all of that was sinking in as that had finished. Everybody was safe. And I'm watching this. We're on the bus. And we didn't tell anyone what route we were taking between the ballpark and Civic Center. right? We didn't dictate. That wasn't public. I didn't tell them which route to take. But it became an impromptu parade route. Hmm. And so sitting on that bus and just watching construction workers come off of their site just to wave at us, I couldn't believe it. And I began to lose it. And, I, and just close to openly sobbing. And then remembered I had to give a speech to 25,000 <laughs> <laughs> at Civic Center and not freak out about that. Um, but the, the energy from the crowd was so loving and so joyful. And Comcast Sportsnet, I, I, I have to give one shout out to them because when I asked them to do me a favor, they followed, their crew followed us around 
taped each caper, came back and edited it on the fly, and then played it that day in Civic Center. Because I said, people I was are like, going to do something. Bridge. All of this Crazy. was free. They donated a $30,000 satellite truck that day <laughs> so all the other stations could pull that video without a watermark. And donated. I mean, they were amazing and pulled that off. And so I had no idea what we were going to see when we got up to Civic Center. And so, but I had my outtakes and we had coordinated. And I'd say, let's take a look. And they'd play the footage. It was unbelievable. Oh, wow. So That's incredible. A lot of goodness happened that day. <laughs> <laughs> and Dana, just a beautiful film. So just kind of what, you, what was Thank your favorite you. moment that you discovered? In um, I mean, my favorite moment of the film was, like I said before, when EJ um, broke his projector. And yeah. um, that was my favorite moment of the film. But I think um, my favorite part in the whole making of it was my goal was to let the spirit of the day live on because for everybody like me who missed, who missed the actual day. And so um, I'm really, when I hear stories like that, what Mike said about his friend or when I have people email me about that it made them go out and want to volunteer and be a part of a community and, and get out of their shell for a while, that makes me really happy and proud. Um, and, but I think for me, um, meeting these guys and everybody involved in the day and then the crew that I was so fortunate to assemble for Bat Kid for the movie, um, those, the cast and the crew of this film are really dear, and um, you feel like now you could take that group along with you to the, to the rest of your life, um, mm -hmm. both professionally and just as friends, and um, to me, that's a real gift. Um, that, and actually, somebody I used to work with is, is here in the audience, and I mean, that's a good thing. We worked on, our, on my first film together, and so I think it's that, it's like you have this fortunate thing as a documentary filmmaker to um, be able to go out there and meet amazing people because nobody, n not just a humdrum person, would be worthy to be in a documentary, right? <laughs> right? And so you have these, these people that you come in contact with and then you get to carry them with you um, hopefully forever. And so I think that's, um, and this group was an amazing addition to all, to all of those people. So. Well, to give you a sense, literally everyone in the project is that lovely, doesn't seek the limelight, was just doing a great thing. And Dana's no different. She volunteered. None of the people who worked on the film thought it was going to be a big film. They all did it for next to nothing or bare minimum, just do it to cover expenses, and, and Dana included. And you know, ironically, she likes to joke that you know, the first documentary that really reached some level of commercial success and was purchased by Warner Brothers is, is a donation. So she's contributed all to the Bat Kid Fund, which benefits wow. um, San Francisco charities, including Make-A-Wish. So um, that's the level of you know, altruistic and generosity of everyone on the project. Well, I think that was the incredible thing that no one was really in this for the money. And no. It was all about Miles and it was all about just just capturing that day for him and stuff. And even two years later, I mean, this is this is really, it's incredible that people are still caring and and wanting this, just that kind of impact that it had on, you know, social media and just in, in culture. It's a culture phenomenon. And people are studying this as like, <laughs> how did this happen? Why did this, you know, and how did this work? And it just, it's one of those just perfect storms. So um, it's, uh, just really quickly, can you talk about a little bit how people can get involved with Make-A-Wish or um, just kind of what Make-A-Wish is doing? So locally, sfwish.org, um, I have a board of directors. I have two young professional boards. I have one here in Silicon Valley. I have a youth board um, for kids 12 to 18. About half of them are former Wish kids who give back. Um, so uh, there's... Uh, and obviously we have events. We just did a, a walk here on Google campus. Um, so there's lots of ways to get involved in fundraising. We're one of the few charities that takes airline mile donations, um, and we use those for the wishes itself. So that's wow. pretty cool and a great way if you want to donate airline miles. Um, and for everyone else, go to wish.org, and, um, and that will lead you to our international affiliates as well and hopefully engage you and, and hopefully change your life forever and transform it in a way that you can't imagine. That's great. So thank you guys so much for being here. Um, Back Kid Begins uh, is available digitally uh, September 25th and on DVD October 6th. So thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.